without further ado, let's uh, dive into our, uh, our third session today. And uh, another big question, do human rights uh, make sense without, uh, without God? Um, well, to set the pattern from the, continue the pattern from the previous talk, let's begin by going back in history uh, a wee while. So on the 3rd of July, 1884, uh, four English sailors uh, were on board a yacht, the Mignonette, and they encountered a horrific storm in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, their yacht sank, leaving them stranded in a tiny wooden lifeboat. They had no food, and they had no water, and by the eighth day of being adrift, they were desperate. And so they made the fateful decision to kill the cabin boy, who was already ill from drinking seawater, and for four more days until they were finally rescued, the three surviving sailors fed on his body and blood. When they returned to England and the story broke, it scandalized the nation. In fact, it scandalized the world. That story spread globally. The survivors were put on trial. They were charged uh, with murder. One sailor turned state's witness, and uh, two others went to trial and freely confessed. They didn't deny what they'd done. They freely admitted they'd killed and they'd eaten their crewmate, and they claimed their defense was they had done that out of necessity. Either one person died or four people died. Now, here's a thought experiment. If you were the judge in the Mignonette trial, how would you rule? I mean, after all, the story leads to two possible conclusions when you think about it. The first conclusion is purely utilitarian. One person was killed, but three people survived. And unlike uh, the cabin boy, with the cabin boy, he left no grieving children, no grieving widow. He had no dependents. The older sailors did. Um, so that's one conclusion. I suspect, unless we have the local branch of Sociopaths Anonymous uh, joining us this morning, nobody here in this room uh, would go for that. And to encourage you, when I do this thought experiment on university campuses, very rarely, occasionally you get one brave soul who is like, absolutely, pass the ketchup. Um, but very few people take that route. Most of us, be as Christians or, or others, have a more visceral reaction. What those three sailors did was wrong, fundamentally wrong, because they violated the cabin boy's rights and his value and dignity. See, whether it's a small crime against humanity, the murder of a cabin boy under desperate circumstances, or whether it's the killing of George Floyd or Ty and Nichols stories that have made international news in, in recent years, or whether it's Russian war crimes uh, in Ukraine, most of us, most human beings, no matter what we believe, most people have the same reaction these days. It is wrong to violate the dignity, uh, the rights of another human being. And that idea, that, that visceral belief that our society has in human rights and dignity is enshrined in the words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, ratified on the 10th of December 1948. And the preamble, the introduction to, the, to that document, one of the most famous legal documents in recent history, uh, runs like this. Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom and justice and peace in the world. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And our societies are passionate about human rights. Uh, we award Nobel Prizes for human rights. We celebrate them, we talk about them, but there's a fairly basic question that is overlooked uh, in most societies, and it's this question. These rights, this dignity, this value that human beings are alleged to have, where is it located? Where is it found? What's its basis? However noble these words may sound, are they in fact true? And Here's a little thought experiment I will often do when talking to, to, more, to more secular audiences uh, to get the, uh, the, the, the creative brain juices going. I like to say to people, imagine for a moment a circle. And inside this circle uh, is, the gene, is the genome, the DNA of everything that exists on planet Earth. Everything that's alive is in that circle somewhere. Uh, ants, uh, amoeba, aardvarks, artichokes, 
human beings, uh, traffic wardens, everything is inside that, that circle there. Never do that joke again. Uh, is, in there, is in there somewhere. Um, now, when we talk about human rights, what are we doing? When we talk about human rights, what we are basically doing is we are drawing a smaller circle inside the big circle and saying, if you live in the small circle that looks like human, that, that represents human life, you have a special set of rights and privileges and dignity that stuff in the bigger circle doesn't. It also has a nice happy coincidence of looking a bit like the Death Star from Star Wars. Um, so that's what we're doing when we talk about human rights. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. What is to stop the white supremacist coming along and drawing a smaller circle inside the larger circle and saying, no, 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 it's only white people of European descent who have this special set of rights and privileges and dignity. Both of us, the human rights advocate and the racial supremacist, they've both drawn circles, random circles inside the big circle. Why is one circle laudable and admirable and why is one circle condemnable and they'll put you beyond polite society? That is the problem that we have to wrestle with, especially our secular friends have to wrestle with when talking about human rights. And there are very few options open to you if you are an atheist. Very, very few options open to atheists at this point. Option number one is pretty brutal, but it's to deny human rights exist. You can simply go, yeah, okay, fair enough. Human rights are not true. Um, when I debated a few years ago, one of the world's leading atheist ethicists, his name is uh, Peter Singer, and we de de debated on the unbelievable uh, show, uh, 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 an apologetics radio show and podcast, probably known to some of you in this room. Peter, himself, who is in fact Australian, lives in the States, but Australian originally, um, Peter took this approach. He said, yeah, human, human rights are a myth. They don't exist. They're not real. Um, there are, as he famously put it, exceptions. Um, he also, by the way, believes that talk of human rights is what he calls guilty of being speciesist, that we are saying that human beings have rights and other creatures don't. So Peter would take the denial route. Yep, there are problems, so we just throw human rights out. Well, of course, a number of problems flow from that, not least that it leads to a pretty brutal kind of world. If someone has the power and the ability to abuse others, well, they can do, and there's nowhere you can appeal. You can't say, what about my human rights? They're a myth. What's the next option? If you are an atheist or a secularist and you do not like the Peter, the Peter Singer route, well, the next thing you could try is you could say human rights just exist because they exist because they exist. I have talked to atheist friends over the years who have sometimes gone this route. They go, well, they're, they're just a brute fact of existence. Problem is that's rather circular, quite Frankly, why do they exist and who says they exist? And what do we do with people who say they don't exist, who want to abuse others? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we can use that approach to claim anything. You know, I can claim I'm a superhero. And if you say, why are you a superhero? Well, I am because I am because I am and you can't ask me. Um, it does all look a bit peculiar. Can we do better? Well, the only other option really that atheists have tried over the years is to say, well, maybe there is something special about human beings. Maybe there's something special. Maybe it's the fact that we have speech or consciousness or moral agency or Vegemite or something. You know, there's something about human beings that makes us special and unique and that means that we get this set of rights that other animals don't. Maybe that's a route we could go. Well, that fails for a reason that the very famous American atheist Sam Harris uh, recognizes. Uh, Sam writes, he says, the problem is that whatever attributes we use to differentiate between humans and animals, intelligence, language use, moral sentiments, and so on, will equally differentiate between human beings themselves. If people are more important to us than orangutans because they can articulate their interests, why aren't more articulate people more important still? And again, the whole idea crashes and burns. Well, the last option open to you, I guess, if you are an atheist and you want to hang on to human rights, is you can appeal to the state. You can say, well, human rights exist because the government grants them. Problem is, of course, if the government grants human rights, the government can take them away. And we live in an age in which I think we are more and more suspicious, many of us, about politicians. And the idea that our deepest rights and values depend on the whims of a few politicians is not a world I think I necessarily want to find myself living in. 
So we have a real problem. Our society has a problem. Our secular friends want to affirm human rights. They want to affirm dignity. Yet finding a basis is all but impossible. How do we solve the problem? Well, maybe a little history can help us here. In 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. And Spanish colonization of the Americas began. And it was not long before reports of Spanish mistreatment of, uh, of natives began to spread. And in 1511, December 1511, on the island of Hispaniola, Monde, Haiti, a Dominican friar called Antonio de Montesinos preached a fiery sermon attacking uh, Spanish behavior towards the natives. Word of that sermon reached the king of Spain, who faced with horrific testimony about what his countrymen were doing out in the colonies, he convened a panel of theologians and jurists, and he tasked them with developing a new body of law to govern how Spanish colonists behaved. Chief among those theologians was a man called Father Francisco de Vitoria, considered today by many people to be the father of international law. He was one of the first people we can find in history arguing that all people are equally free and have the right to life, culture, and property, irrespective of their nationality. Similar arguments were advanced by Bartolome de, de las Casas, who today is considered a saint throughout Latin America for what he did for the native people. And then lastly, we have Francisco Suarez, who in 1610 wrote an essay called On the Laws, in which he argued that human beings have rights because they were endowed with them by their creator. If human beings are God's special creation, he argued, that gives an excellent grounding for treating people with respect and with dignity. Suarez's essay influenced John Locke, John Locke influenced Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson baked that idea right into the heart of the U.S. Constitution, another famous legal document that talks about the equality of all human beings. And all these thinkers who laid the foundations, the first building blocks of what we now know as human rights, they were not moralizing in a vacuum. They were not making things up as they went along, but they rooted all of their arguments in the Christian understanding that human beings bear the image of of God. That's a claim unique to the Bible, which says in Genesis chapter 1 that God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. And the influence that this passage of scripture has had has been phenomenal and is actually recognized by many atheist thinkers and historians. One of the most influential French atheists working today is a gentleman called Luke Ferry. And a few years ago, Luke wrote a book called A Brief History of Thought. And in that book, in that survey of Western thought for over 2,000 years, he makes the observation that in the Greco-Roman world, it was taken as an absolute given that some people were inferior to others. Everybody in the Greco-Roman world knew that slaves and women and children were right at the bottom of the pile. And then he observes, in direct contradiction to that Greek world, Christianity was to introduce the notion that humanity was fundamentally identical, that people were equal in dignity, an unprecedented idea at the time, and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. But that notion of equality did not come from nowhere. And he goes on to say that even though he's an atheist and would disagree with Christianity and a whole raft of things, he is profoundly grateful to that idea of equality taught there in the Old Testament. That idea did not come from nowhere. It came from the Christian worldview. And it's easy to forget the difference that a worldview makes. And I think our society has not yet learned the lesson that it's not clear that the flower of human rights that first grew in a Christian understanding of what it means to be human can that plant still survive when you cut the roots off? Because as another older atheist, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, one of the most influential atheists of all time, once remarked, he said, the masses blink, and they say, we are all equal. Man is but man, but before God, we are all equal. Before God, but now this God has died. 
And so Nietzsche would look at this claim of equality and go, yeah, if you believe in God, great, but God is dead, there is no God, and so this idea of equality is a total nonsense. So I am regularly saying to my secular friends and to secular audiences, you quite frankly, you have a choice. You can adopt a Christian understanding of humanity, that we have real value and real dignity because we bear God's image, or you can reject that narrative ignore the consequences, stick your fingers in your ears, refuse to answer Nietzsche's question, and pretend everything will be okay. But one last thought uh, for you. If um, human beings have dignity, how sh why should that affect how we behave? Why should that actually change our behavior? Let's suppose that uh, you know, after this, uh, this morning's talk, out there during the lunchtime uh, break, uh, you bump into myself and, uh, and Rob, and you bump, to us in the, bump into us in the, in the lobby, I poke you in the eye, uh, Rob trips you up, and we both steal your coffee. And uh, you look at us and go, but hang on, you violated my human rights, how dare you? And we look at you and we say, yeah, so what? How can you compel us? How can you compel us? You see, you can't talk about rights without talking about responsibilities. Something else our culture has forgotten about. We've disconnected rights from responsibilities. What are, what are our responsibilities towards a uh, fellow uh, human being, and uh, why is that? Well, that question opens up a whole new can of worms. It opens up the same question we thought about in the last talk, in fact. Are, is there a way we're supposed to be? Are some actions really right, and are some actions really wrong? Listen to the words of Harvard University law professor Michael Sandel, arguably one of the world's leading experts on questions around justice and rights. His book, Justice, is one of the single best reads I've ever read on the question of justice and human rights. Again, not a Christian. He's very sympathetic to our position, um, but his conclusion is very interesting. He concludes his long survey of attempts to find a basis for justice in society by saying debates about justice and rights are often unavoidably debates about purpose. Despite our best efforts to make the law neutral on such questions, it may not be possible to say what is just without first arguing about the nature of the good life. And his observation, I think, gets to the heart of the question of what it means to be a human being, which we keep coming into on so many of these topics. Are we creatures designed to seek justice and goodness and fairness, or are we just primates who got lucky in the evolutionary lottery whose genes are purely directed at reproductive success? Only, I would say, if we are made for something can we even begin to talk about responsibility, about the way that we should live. And we'll write back to that question of purpose we saw in the last talk. So the question I always like to challenge my secular friends on is, what about us? What are we as human beings? Are we just an accidental collocation of atoms? Are we just tormented atoms in a bed of mud? Are we a robotic genetic vehicle dancing to its DNA? Or are we a 1% bit of pollution in the universe. Four answers from atheist writers over the years. Four atheist writers who also will not be getting hired as motivational speakers anytime soon. Are these answers true? I would often say to my friends. Or is the Christian story true? Because if it is, we were made for a purpose. We were made for something. Or more specifically, made for someone. We were made to discover God's love, to love God in return, and to love our neighbor, and indeed our enemies. If Christianity is true, love is the supreme ethic, the supreme value that God has built into the universe. That's what it means to be human, and it gives an oughtness to human life. And I believe that human rights and justice only work if love is that supreme foundation to the universe, built into the very fundamental fabric of all that exists by the God who brought it into existence. Talking of love reminds me of one of my favorite stories from history. I've given you a little bit of history this morning. One more uh, little historical figure for you this morning. The figure on the screen behind me, Maximilian Kolbe. It's probably a name not known to many of you. It's a name who deserves to be much greater known. His story not as famous today as it once was. Who was he? Well, Maximilian was a Polish Catholic monk 
arrested by the German Gestapo in 1941 because he had been, uh, for his human rights activism, he had been rescuing Jews and other uh, victims of the Third Reich, hiding them in his monastery and then smuggling them to safety out of occupied Poland. He saved many, many lives. Well, in 1941, the Germans found out what he was doing. They arrested him. He was flung into the notorious Auschwitz concentration camp. A year after he was arrested, another prisoner escaped from the camp. And that deeply infuriated the, uh, the camp authorities. So the commander of Auschwitz had all the prisoners gathered together in the prison yard. And he announced that he was going to pick the names of 10 men at random. And those men would be taken away and locked up in an underground cell with no food and no water, just left to die, to send a message. If you escape from this camp, this is what we do to your friends. And he was true to his word. He read the name of 10 men at random. And one of those men, when his name was read out, began to have hysterics, as you might imagine. Began to scream, scream out and cry, my, my wife and my family, what, whatever will become of them? On hearing that, Maximilian stepped out of the crowd of prisoners and looked the commandant in the eye and said, Sir, may I take the place of that man? The commander agreed. The other prisoner was released. Maximilian was taken away with those nine others and locked up in that underground cell where they took two weeks to die of starvation and dehydration. And we know the story, by the way, because the man whose life he saved uh, survived the war, was liberated in 1945, and spent the rest of his days telling the story of what had been done of him. And I always like to ask people when I tell that story, it raises some interesting questions, doesn't it? Why did Maximilian do this? You see, if atheism is true we have to conclude that Maximilian was a total idiot. He was a fool. On atheism, the only thing you have is your life. It's all you have. And the idiot throws it away for some gesture that's meaningless. On the other hand, if the secular story isn't true, but the biblical story is, then Maximilian made the wisest of choices. He acted the way he did because he believed that love was the supreme ethic. He acted the way he did because he was following the words of his Lord, Jesus, who said, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. And of course, Jesus himself demonstrated this supremely. And that's an important point to land on, because saying that human rights only makes sense, only makes, it raises that naturally the question, uh, that human rights only make sense if God exists, naturally raises the question, which God are we talking about? And in Jesus, we have a God who looks very different. You see, human rights only has a basis if human beings have real dignity and real value. And economists will tell you, economists will tell you that something's value is determined by what someone is prepared to pay. So here I have my iPhone 14. I paid quite a lot of money for this. It's very useful to me to be able to use Google Maps and to play uh, computer games while sitting on the lavatory. It's a very important uh, piece of uh, research, a tool for me. But if you took my iPhone 14 to a desert island where there was no cell phone reception, no mobile reception, no Wi-Fi, no power, and possibly no flushing lavatories either, um, what would somebody pay me for this? Probably not a lot. It might make a nice chopping board for shellfish, but otherwise pretty useless. It's not inherently worth hundreds of dollars. That's what someone's prepared to pay. Well, if value is conferred by what someone is prepared to pay, what is our value as human beings? What is our value for human beings? What was someone prepared to pay for us? Well, the Bible tells us that God was willing to pay an incredibly high price for us, the price of Jesus Christ, his son. That is why we have value and why we have dignity. And on that basis, and only that basis, I think, can we talk meaningfully about human rights and justice and dignity.